All right. I think it's it's about that time. So uh, I'm Jamie McCabe. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Zach Steinberg, for Cardiology Grand Rounds today at University of Washington. As many of you know, uh, Zach comes to us by way of undergraduate uh, work at University of Wisconsin, followed by medical school at George Washington University. He then um, got a little lost in the woods for a while, went to Oregon for uh, residency at OHSU until he found his path and uh, came to University of Washington for general cardiology fellowship, which then uh, segued into interventional cardiology fellowship and then transitioned further into adult congenital heart disease fellowship um, and before he landed on faculty here with us in 2017. Um, he has subsequently taken over the um, fellowship director position for interventional cardiology in 2018 or 19. Um, and despite all the training in adult congenital and his expertise there, we said, Zach, it'd be great if you take on uh, a f even more clinical work um, by virtue of um, learning about balloon pulmonary angioplasty Little did we know that that um, that he would take it on with such gusto and, and really become a national leader in this nascent space um, in conjunction with Peter O'Leary from Pulmonology. And they, they're they really, uh, they're making the news, not reading the news. So we're really excited to hear from Zach about, uh, about his Grand Rounds talk. Zach. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for that introduction. I'm excited to give this talk as well. I've been working on balloon pulmonary angioplasty in this patient population of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which is also known as CTEF uh, for most people, for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I knew very little about this disease state. I recognize that this tends to be the domain of pulmonologists or at least uh, practitioners treating pulmonary vascular disease like pulmonary hypertension experts. But there is overlap with the diseases that we see. Many of the patients I treat have comorbid cardiac conditions and it's a diagnosis that can be often missed. So I think there is uh, some relevance to the cardiology community as well. If you remember nothing else about my talk today, I think these four take home points really would suffice. The first is that CTEF is a bad disease. It's challenging to diagnose. And if it's not diagnosed early, patients do worse. Pulmonary thromboendarterectomy, surgical intervention is the best treatment uh, that's available still after decades, uh, but not everyone is eligible. For those people, pulmonary vasodilators may help symptoms, but somewhat minimally so, and it doesn't treat the underlying pathology. So a lot of these patients are left with pretty significant disease. That said, balloon pulmonary angioplasty for inoperative candidates is on the rise, but as Jamie said, it's a nascent field and has trailed far behind uh, coronary angioplasty, and there's a reason for that, and I will explain as I go along. CTEF. What CTEF is, it's failure for acute embolism to resorb uh, after the acute event. This apparently occurs in upwards of 4% of patients who present with an acute PE. And there's two major presentations, although there's, there's some variation within this, but two main ways that people will present. The first is that they have a large thrombotic occlusion of a large uh, pulmonary artery branch. They develop symptoms. They seek active care. They go on anticoagulation. And after months, their symptoms remain. They get a further workup and find that they have unresolved thrombus in their pulmonary arteries. The second is a much more insidious course. And these people throw smaller pulmonary embolisms such that there is no sentinel event. Uh, and slowly over time, as they develop a greater and greater burden of these thrombotic occlusions in smaller branches, they develop worsening symptoms, eventually leading them to a cascade of tests and an ultimate diagnosis of CTEF. When the clot 
enters the lung, it actually undergoes changes fairly quickly if it isn't broken down. In the top panel, I have three pictures. Uh, these are taken from an animal model of pulmonary embolism at different time courses. And all three pictures are a trichrome stain. So they do a really good job of showing fibrosis. On day one, you can see a very red uh, slide. It's platelet rich and red blood cell rich thrombus plug. By one week, you already begin to see pretty extensive invasion of fibrotic material in collagen taking over the fresh thrombus. And by one month, it's almost entirely fibrotic material and no longer a clot that will respond to any sort of anticoagulation or any kind of uh, antithrombotic treatment. Over time, uh, these thrombotic or rather fibrotic plugs mature. And as you can see in the bottom picture, this is an H and E stain of a more mature fibrotic plug. And you can see uh, re-canalization in many parts of this thrombus, but the lumen of the vessel remains largely obstructed. If there's one cause of CTEF, which is to say a reason that uh, these thrombi are not being reabsorbed properly, it's not known. Um, but there are recognized risk factors. Uh, they have to do with features of presentation and underlying patient comorbidities. The larger the thrombus, the more often people are throwing thrombuses, the more likely they're going to develop retained clot and manifest pulmonary hypertension. Patients who have underlying hypercoagulable disorders, um, whether it's a genetic condition or from comorbidities such as malignancy or autoimmune disease are also at greater risk for CTEF. But we're also seeing a patient population with comorbidities we don't necessarily associate with a high thrombotic burden, but who live sedentary lifestyles and they present with this as well. If there's one rule I think I feel comfortable making about CTEF is that people who make a lot of clot are at the greatest risk for developing the disease. The pulmonary hypertension from the obstructive phenomenon is self-perpetuating. Uh, what happens with progressive occlusion of these vessels is that pulmonary pressures rise uh, in kind. And there are unaffected vessels all over the place as well. The thrombus doesn't go into every vessel. What happens with these unaffected vessels is they're exposed to high PA pressures uh, for weeks, months, or years and develop a secondary arteriolar hypertension uh, and vascular changes on a microscopic level. And this, of course, is self-perpetuating. High PA pressures begets pulmonary vascular remodeling and PA pressures uh, jump even higher. So to take a moment and repeat, CTEF is a problem where some clot in the lung does not reabsorb properly. Many smaller PEs go undiagnosed, and these patients tend to have longstanding hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, uh, without really knowing about it until it becomes quite severe. And a rise in PA pressures from the obstruct uh, obstructive phenomena may result in a secondary pulmonary arteriolar process and worsening pulmonary hypertension. There are a few longitudinal natural history studies, the largest of which was published in the early 80s, looking at 76 patients who presented with CTEF between the mid-1960s and the 1970s. They had extensive follow-up. Almost every patient was on anticoagulation at the time of diagnosis. And most patients had about 10 years of follow-up, some a little more, some a little less. And they ended up stratifying patients uh, based on their mean PA pressure on presentation. And what they found was that patients who had more modestly elevated mean PA pressures uh, in the 20s and 30s or less than 20s had a survival out to 10 years that was equal that of the estimated survival for their age match population. Whereas those who presented with a mean PA pressure higher than 30 fared worse, and there was a statistically significant difference in mortality, and that uh, the worst prognosis um, was seen and worsened as PA pressures rose. Fortunately, there is therapy for this disease. The mainstay of prevention is anticoagulation. For many years, it was warfarin, but DOACs are used across the board in these patients, and they do well. The Treatment of the underlying 
pulmonary hypertension and symptoms comes down to three approaches, pulmonary vasodilators, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy, a surgical procedure, and balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And I'll focus the remainder of the talk on these three treatment modalities. Surgical pulmonary thromboendarterectomy was first introduced in the late 1960s as a bypass was becoming increasingly common. Uh, it's performed with a sternotomy and undercardiopulmonary bypass. A surgeon enters the proximal pulmonary arteries, as you can see in this video, and finds a dissection plane between the intima and media of the affected vessels and works to remove the thrombus and block. And it does, he, he or she does so through these fascial planes. And the idea shown here on the left panel is to remove the thrombus as one complete unit. That way, grabbing hold of the proximal thrombus, you can pull out the distal disease. Looking at modern day outcomes of surgery, um, it's quite effective. This is uh, data from a CTEF registry of 17 centers in Europe performing surgical PTE. They report on nearly 400 patients who underwent the procedure in the mid-2000s, and they show uh, really uh, excellent hemodynamic improvements from um, PVRs in the nines to PVRs near normal around three, a two-thirds drop, and uh, functional improvements uh, were seen as well with MYHA class three and four, 75% moving to 88% of MYHA class one to two post-operatively. Um, but it's not a risk-free procedure. Mortality is higher than some of our more common uh, cardiac interventions, around 5%. At least that's what these centers reported. Other centers have better mortality. UCSD has been a leader in surgical PTE since the 60s, and they have one of the busiest practices. Around the same era, uh, as the European registry, they reported data on 500 patients undergoing PTE. And you can see that their preoperative and postoperative PBRs are very, very similar, but their surgical mortality is half that of the European registry. Um, and I think that is at least in part a reflection of their experience and their volume. UCSD over this time frame was performing 125 PTE cases per year, whereas all 17 centers in Europe uh, we're performing 193 together. PTE is a great uh, solution for many people, but many people are inoperable. The European Registry reported 37% of all patients presenting with CTEF at their institutions to be inoperable. Another single center review over the same time frame reported 41% inoperability, and they published the reasons that patients were deemed inoperable. There was about 10, maybe 13% of patients who refused surgery. Nearly a quarter of patients had high comorbidities raising surgical risk and they were turned down for that reason. But by far the vast majority had disease that was considered to be surgically inaccessible. And this is uh, four pictures from cadaveric specimens that will help to demonstrate the difficulty in accessing distal lesions. Uh, disease is classified and categorized based on how proximal it extends. Here's level one. It's the most proximally extending. It affects the main branch PAs, the right and left, and in this case, it's crossing the midline. Level two disease extends out to the hilum. Level three disease is, uh, affects the segmental level of which there's 10 per lung. And level four disease is subsegmental. Level one and two, readily surgical, surgically available and accessible. Level three and four, much more difficult. Not all pulmonary thromboendarterectomy results in a truly satisfactory result. In the European registry, nearly one in five patients still had an elevated PVR. Most of them improved, but their PVRs were um, at least twice normal. Um, also, patients who undergo PTE have been known to develop recurrent pulmonary hypertension most closely associated with anticoagulation non-adherence. 
Whatever the reason, most centers will not offer repeat surgical intervention because the initial surgical intervention alters tissue planes enough that it really complicates re-intervention. Pulmonary vasodilators do help and they are used in inoperable patients. Um, and they've been fairly extensively studied. Uh, there are four, three classes that have been really well looked at. Rio Siguant um, is a guanylate cyclase stimulator. The endothelin receptor antagonists, both sentin and mass have been looked at. And troprostanol, which is a prostaglandin agonist, um, have all been looked at in randomized placebo-controlled trials extending somewhat six months out with um, full hemodynamics pre and post. And what they showed is that all of these pulmonary vasodilators improved hemodynamics. But with the exception of Rio Siguat, the rest had no change in either functional class or quality of life. One of the explanations for this is the attendant side effects of these medications. People manifest peripheral edema, intractable headaches, uh, reflux disease, which is quite severe, and nausea and vomiting, just to name a few. Uh, additionally, systemic hypotension is seen with these medications, limiting up titration in some people. And these medications worsen hypoxemia by worsening VQ mismatch. It's also noteworthy to point out that probably where these have their greatest effects is dealing with the secondary pulmonary arteriolar hypertension in most people, but does nothing to the obstructive phenomena that exists within the lungs. To summarize, surgical pulmonary thromboendarterectomy is very effective, but many patients are inoperable, and pulmonary vasodilators are of somewhat limited benefit. So many patients go untreated with their disease. Um, and this is where we pick up with balloon pulmonary angioplasty, which I'll refer to as BPA, commonly known and how it fills this needed uh, gap in care for these patients. BPA is very similar to coronary angioplasty, and this cartoon will help to um, outline the major steps. You start off with a fibrotic plug in a pulmonary vessel. You pass a wire across the lesion. You slide a balloon over the wire, inflate it, and the hope is that you have completely alleviated obstruction and restored proper flow distally. In truth, it's not nearly as effective as that. These fibrotic lesions are very elastic. There's a lot of recoil. Oftentimes, multiple interventions with larger balloons are needed. Um, but ultimately, uh, a satisfactory result is achieved in most of these lesions. The first experience of BPA was published in the early 2000s by Feinstein and his group at Boston Children's. They reported 18 patients with CTEF who were inoperable, who underwent angioplasties between the mid and late 1990s. Of the 18 patients, they were brought forward for 47 procedures with a total of 107 lesions treated, which is roughly two lesions per intervention and about six lesions per patient. He demonstrated pretty good functional improvement everybody had an improvement in six minute walk capacity. As you can see in the bottom right graph, all the lines slope upwards. Almost everyone had a, an, a decrease in New York Heart Association class aside from one individual. And mean, mean PA pressures on average improved, although it's notable that mean PA pressures on average did not uh, drop to normal levels. It was still in the mid thirties. He reported his complications as well. Um, and this was um, somewhat surprising to the community at large. Uh, only a third of patients had no issues. About a third of patients had what was at the time described as a reperfusion injury. They, they, their um, oxygen worsened and they had radiographic evidence of infiltrates and they required longer hospitalizations with supplemental oxygen and diuresis. Some patients had a worse course than that and required some form of mechanical ventilation, almost a quarter, and one patient died as a result. Um, and so this was quite alarming to the community because the hemodynamic results they felt were uh, 
rather modest and to see such a high degree of complications. Although this, you know, the counterbalance of, of this argument is that this is a highly morbid patient population who really didn't have a lot of other options. And this was just an initial study. Um, and the, one can debate how this was accepted by the community, but but what ended up happening is it lost the confidence of the CTEF treating community. And BPA essentially was halted by almost every institution for over a decade as a result. To give you a sense of the timeline of therapeutics of this disease, warfarin has been around since the 1950s and has been a mainstay of preventative treatment in this disease. Everyone was placed on it until most recently when DOACs are treated. Um, in the late 1960s, surgical pulmonary thromboendarterectomy was introduced and has increased in uh, numbers, in efficacy with a decreasing mortality and remains the mainstay of treatment. In the mid 1990s, Feinstein's group began BPAs, but in the early 2000s, after he published his result, progress grinded to a halt and nobody was performing these, near nobody. And then beginning in the early 2000s, there was development of pulmonary vasodilators. About a decade later, many of these were studied in the CTEF population, but they were being used beforehand. And it wasn't until the early 20 teens that BPA um, sort of reared its head again and began to be accepted by the community. And the person largely responsible for this is Hiromi Matsubara, a physician in Japan. Uh, Matsubara's group published a study in 2012, uh, by far the largest retrospective look at BPA patients to date, 68 patients in whom he performed 255 procedures. He was very aware of the community's response to Feinstein, so he had some specific goals. Um, he wanted to demonstrate a significant improvement in hemodynamics and show that he could reduce the number of serious complications. Um, he went to great lengths to do both of these. Uh, he performed IVIS guided angioplasty on all the vessels to ensure he was sizing the balloons appropriately in order to maximize hemodynamic improvements. He performed repeated interventions on lesions as he would bring them back for additional procedures. He'd go and retreat lesions and he kept performing procedures uh, with a goal of reducing mean PA pressures to less than 30. And that turned into many more interventions per patient. And when you look at how many lesions on average were being treated between Feinstein's group and Matsubara's group, it was almost double, nearly 12 lesions per patient. He put even more effort to reducing risk, knowing that this was really the main objection of the community. Um, he did this for every patient and every procedure. And keep in mind, that's 255 times. He, every patient was admitted five days prior to procedure and placed on an ibuprostenol drip. Those with a reduced cardiac index were put on a dobutamine drip for the same duration. During the procedure, he paid close attention to oxygen saturations. If they fell more than 4%, he ended the procedure. And for post-procedural management, patients stayed in the hospital for days. Everyone came out on BiPAP. Everyone came out with a swan catheter in place. And both of those may or may not have been weaned off starting at 24 hours. Every patient was given methylprednisolone for three days. Um, and the reason is that Feinstein's initial uh, publication made people concerned for a reperfusion injury. And that's what he thought he was treating. It turns out that these are very unlikely to be reperfusion injuries, but rather actually vascular disruption from the aggressive balloons and rudimentary balloons that were used back in the 90s. Um, but that was the thought at the time. And uh, that's what Matsubara was responding to. And then patients were ultimately weaned from ipoprostenol and dobutamine after three days. So patients were staying in the hospital over a week per procedure and really unsustainable uh, in the long term, but he was successful in showing a really significant hemodynamic improvement. He had substantial falls in mean PA pressures and PVR on the left and right hand boxes and uh, significant increases in cardiac index. And he followed these patients up for more than two years, about 2.2 years on average, and performed right heart casts. And these hemodynamic results 
were durable. Similarly, functional class was uh, profoundly improved from the entirety of the patients at WHO functional class three and four uh, pre-procedure. Within two years of follow-up, the entirety was functional class one or two. He did report complications. It wasn't complication free. He had one death, although this was in a critically ill patient prior to the procedure and the death occurred a month after. Vascular injury was relatively common, manifesting largely as hemosputum or some form of mild hemoptysis in about one in five patients. But rarely did this require more extensive treatment such as mechanical ventilation with intubation um, rather than BiPAP. He also reported uh, an incidence of pulmonary artery perforation at 2.3%, some of which underwent coil embolization. But when you compare Feinstein's and Matsubara's data, Matsubara had much more profound improvements in mean PA pressure and cardiac index where Feinstein saw no result and his complication rate was less than half. Um, and he ultimately succeeded in winning over the community and BPA began to spread and first centers popped up in Japan. Shortly thereafter, it spread to Europe and shortly thereafter, it came to the United States and there are centers in each of these countries uh, and more, although these are the main countries that continue to put out information and publish on their results. As BPA became more widespread, Matsubara put out another landmark publication four years after his first, describing the phenotypes of the disease within the PAs and reporting on their, his level of success in intervention and the level of complication. He uh, reported five different phenotypes, which are still used today. The first is ring lesions. They're discrete lesions in the PAs, but the distal pulmonary artery is normal in caliber. He described web lesions, where, which are difficult at first to recognize, but you can, you can see them. Their hallmark are these linear hypodensities or slight haziness during injections. This is thrombus that's actually filling up almost the entirety of the lumen, uh, but probably closely resembles that H&E slide I showed you before with this recanalization, where you're seeing contrast fill up the entire diameter of the vessel, but it's very obstructive. There's subtotal occlusions where you can see a distal underfilled vessel. You can see the parent vessel, but you don't see any connection between them because the obstruction is so significant. Total occlusions, which speak for themselves for the most part, there's no distal visualization of these lesions. And tortuous lesions. Um, tortuous lesions sort of peter out at the very distal pulmonary arterial tree. Uh, they unnaturally taper. And it's not really clear whether or not this represents microthrombi or perhaps the secondary pulmonary arteriolar process in patients with more advanced disease. Um, but he intervened on all of these with different success and complication rates. Ring and web lesions had a very high chance of success and a very low rate of complications, which was described as pulmonary vascular injury of some sort. Subtotal lesions, there was a reasonably high success rate, but quite a high complication rate. He would exit the vessel often. CTOs, CTOs had a low success rate and a relatively high complication rate, though not as high as the subtotal occlusions, largely because in many cases he couldn't get the wire across, as he describes. And then tortuous lesions had a low success rate and a very high complication rate and really are questionable as to whether or not they're appropriate targets for this therapy to begin with, or whether or not we're treating the appropriate pathology in those lesions. This really helped to inform the community as well as to how to avoid higher risk procedures. And as a result, centers began publishing results when attempting to intervene on subtotal and CTO lesions and when they only focused on ring and web lesions. And as a result, some centers abandoned treating these higher risk lesions altogether. Uh, so to sum up, BPA is currently growing in acceptance as a therapeutic strategy. It's still considered a high-risk procedure, and CTOs and subtotal occlusions represent the highest-risk lesions, and some centers have shied away from intervening on them. <laughs>
And that brings us to the UW experience. Our BPA program launched about two and a half years ago, um, head by Peter Leary, um, who has really put together an amazing team. Everyone with CTEF gets brought forward for a multidisciplinary discussion. Um, it's led by the Pulmonary Vascular Disease Group, Drs. Leary, Ralph, and Rayner. Um, Dr. Mike Mulligan is in attendance. He's the UW surgeon who performs surgical pulmonary thromboendarterectomies and has for many, many years. Um, I represent the interventional group and in balloon pulmonary angioplasty therapy. And then we have three advanced imagers that really aid with uh, pre-procedural planning and helping to define the location of disease. And those include Dr. Valji or Dovas and Dr. Chen. We have emerged as a pretty large center for balloon pulmonary angioplasty over the last few years. It's still quite a nascent field and growing, um, but there are a few centers who are doing reasonably high volumes of which we are one. High volumes in this field is considered to be about greater than 30 interventions per year. We do nearly 50. Um, we, as you can see, are the lone Northwesterners and we share the West Coast with UCSD. The remaining six centers are collected in the Northeast or Eastern Midwest. Our numbers are as follows. Uh, in 2018, late 2018, we started our program. 2019, we really got up and rolling. In 2020, as you can see here in a dip, we were, we were affected by COVID to a large degree. These are high risk patients for COVID. So for many months, we were not performing these procedures. And then we've back, been back up and running since late 2020. But if you look at cases per active month, you can see that every year we seem to be growing in the number of cases per active month. To date, we have done 105 procedures on 26 patients, 18 of which have completed their treatment. The other 18 are in some stage of their intervention. And here's some basic demographic data. A patient age, it averages around around 66, but we have patients in their 20s, a couple of them, and we have a few patients in their late 70s. There's a slight male predominance of our patient group. Um, the vast majority of patients, if not all, are on a pulmonary vasodilator, with the most being on Riosigwad. Uh, the endothelial receptor ant antagonists are also quite common, and many people are on more than one. 100% of patients are being treated with anticoagulation. DOACs are now more common than warfarin because of ease of use. As far as indication, much like others have reported, by far distal location of disease is the number one reason patients are referred to balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Although about one in five either are considered high operative risk from comorbidities or have undergone prior thromboendarterectomy and are not considered good uh, surgical re-op candidates. And only 4% have refused surgical intervention. In general, if patients are turned down for surgery, um, almost routinely we offer BPA. Here are some initial um, hemodynamic outcomes. This is on 21 patients, not the full complement of our patients, but these are on patients who've completed the treatment or have undergone at least four treatments so far. And I've broken these down into three groups and I'm sharing only change in pulmonary vascular resistance. I think that's a pretty comprehensive hemodynamic uh, variable for this population. There are those who had a pretty robust response. They decreased greater than two wood units. Those who had a fairly modest response decreasing by only one to two wood units. And those who really had very little change or had a slight increase in PVR, the zero to one uh, wood unit increase group. To look a little bit more closely at these groups, the, those that improved substantially to over a third, 43% had uh, a pretty robust improvement. On average, these are patients who presented with higher pulmonary vascular resistances. Um, most patients, all patients were above four wood units. About half of the patients were above six wood units and two of the patients had really, really high PVRs and, and really surgical level disease, but for one reason or another were not operative candidates. 
The next group, about a third of patients in this group had the more modest improvements. And as a general rule, looking over, most of these patients were presenting with lower PVRs at baseline. The majority were under four wood units, although there's two outliers and, and one extreme outlier up here. And then about a third of patients had no response or had a slight worsening in PVR over the course of their treatments. Um, and on average, these were patients also with lower PVRs to start with, around four or lower. It's also notable that two of these patients are having ongoing balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And one of these patients, uh, we may have had the wrong diagnosis, angioplasty or at least targeted uh, angiography suggests a, a different underlying process such as a pulmonary vasculitis. Despite the fact that there's a lot of heterogeneity with the response in the hemodynamics, most patients, if not all patients, are feeling better after their intervention, which is surprising um, given that not everyone has a response uh, that's evident by hemodynamics. Going into the procedures, 43% were MYHA class one or two. Uh, at most recent follow-up, 100% of patients are MYHA class one or two. And I can think of three possibilities for this finding. The first is that the non-responders in terms of hemodynamics were all MYHA class one or two at baseline. This is a reasonable thought. These patients had lower pulmonary vascular resistances at baseline than the rest of the group. Another explanation is a placebo effect, and no one has looked at BPA in a randomized sham controlled study, certainly a possibility. And the third possibility is that resting right heart catheterization hemodynamics tell an incomplete story, especially in those patients who have lower PVR at baseline but are symptomatic. The thinking there is that Yes, PVR did not change at baseline with intervention, but mean PA pressures may not rise as much if we're getting rid of some of the obstruction, and it may be more evident with exertion. And we don't perform exercise pre and post uh, right heart catheterizations, although other people have in studies and small studies and have shown this. We have complications like everyone who does this has complications, but our complications have not been nearly as significant as others have described, at least historically. Uh, about almost three quarters of patients have absolutely no issue whatsoever. They all are admitted overnight for observation and discharged the next morning. This is a group of patients who have a very smooth post-procedural course. About one in five patients, much like Matsubara showed, our patients have some mild hemoptysis. Almost routinely, this is during the procedure. And these are patients who have no subsequent issue. They cough a little bit. It can be a hint that maybe I should move my wire or balloon to another area. And we move on about the procedure. Um, uh, there is another subsegment of patients, about 11%, who had more clinically evident injury, 9% of which. Um, who had these true ruptures or um, extravasation of, of blood in contrast into the surrounding space underwent balloon tamponade only to treat it. Um, and then we went on about our business and continued a procedure and those patients did great. Two patients, 2% um, of procedures resulted in an intubation because of a pulmonary artery rupture. This was done in advance of true respiratory distress. Um, um, and those patients did fine. They spent a day or two extra in the hospital, were discharged and came back for repeated interventions and did well. And in one case, an early case of pulmonary rupture, I occluded the vessel with a device, although I have not really had to do that um, uh, since. I have one uh, incidence of catheter-induced AFib uh, and importantly, I've had a 0% mortality thus far. As I've gained experience with this procedure um, and was able to figure out how to manage some of these complications, I became interested in tackling the issue of CTOs. Um, Matsubara's data really leaves open to interpretation how big this issue is of CTOs. He reported that only three and a half percent of the lesions he intervened on were CTOs, uh, 
it's not clear if that's because they're not very common or because um, they, he, he had a low success rate and a higher complication rate and just choose to avoid them. It turns out, or at least in my experience, CTOs are common. Um, about 11 out of 12 patients that I've treated have at least one identified CTO. And some of the time, these are in rather small vessels in these subsegmental branches. Um, but a lot of times they're in much larger branches at the segmental level or the supersegmental level. And revascularizing this territory has potentially major impact on patient symptoms and hemodynamics. I took on the task of figuring out whether these could be opened predictably and safely. Um, and to do that, I recognized a number of challenges in this pathology. The first is that it would require high penetration force wires or very stiff wires in order to cross the CTO lesion. And these were wires that are not being routinely used by the community because of risk of perforation. But it also requires a knowledge of coronary CTO equipment and access to CTO equipment. The second is understanding that the vessel course and figuring out where the vessel is extending is going to be an issue because there's no distal visualization. That's in contrast to what we do in the coronaries with CTOs. And this is a picture of a coronary CTO where you can see a, a chronic occlusion, a long segment of occlusion in a right coronary artery, um, but there is a retrograde injection and opacification of the distal vessel through these collaterals. This doesn't happen in pulmonary branches. There's almost never collateral occlusion, uh, excuse me, uh, collateralization, and the ability to distally visualize these vessels. This is a stump occlusion right here of a major segmental branch in a patient, and it's very difficult to know where this vessel is heading. Um, this is the ultimate result. It's a long, large arborizing branch, but you don't have any of that information at the start. When you add together aggressive stiff wires and no distal visualizations, you are guaranteed to exit the vessel at some point. And you need to be able to recognize this and manage this. Here are examples of where I have found myself. Um, I've been in the alveoli more than a few times. What you're seeing there is a contrast injection through a microcatheter. These are catheters that slide over the wire. They prevent um, uh, using really large balloons to open up vessels, but also give you an idea potentially of where you are. Here in the middle panel is a microcatheter injection in the bronchi. Uh, I did not mean to end up there. And on the right panel, you see an injection in, with free-flowing contrast, and it settles out into the fissure because I'm in the pleura. Um, that was unintended as well. It turns out managing these complications are relatively straightforward, um, even though um, they make me nauseous every time I see these pictures, uh, I still feel confident that I can manage these problems safely. None of these patients required much in the way of active intervention because the thrombus that I've moved through on my way to exiting the vessel, as I mentioned before, is highly elastic. And if you pull your gear out, as long as you haven't performed aggressive balloon dilation in them, most of these lesions seal up immediately and there's no more contrast extravasation although not always. And the way to manage it, if there is continued extravasation is to inflate a balloon proximally and tamponade it off. Unlike in the coronaries, you can do this and keep a balloon up for an hour and a half if you'd like. There is no hemodynamic consequence. There's no distal ischemia that results. And so it's a very manageable situation. And those few patients who I did elect to intubate had balloon tamponade and were not actively bleeding at the time it was done in a very controlled fashion. You can also reverse heparin during that time as well. And the vast majority of people that get these balloon tamponades, even if their heparin's reversed, once things seal up, I can rebolus heparin and I usually move to a different lesion, um, but you can return to these lesions on another day and get to work again and people do well. <laughs>
This is an example of what a CTO in intervention looks like that's successful. Um, here you can see a selective injection into a, a major uh, pulmonary artery branch. This is at the segmental level and the contrast goes nowhere, ends in a blind pouch. So here I am advancing a stiff wire, an aggressive wire across the lesion into what I'm hoping is a vascular space. And I slide the microcatheter over the wire and then inject some contrast through there. And you can see a stain right in at the end of the tip of this microcatheter. I am not in the vessel lumen, but I am in the vessel. I'm in the sub intima. And there's, some, there's a few different techniques I can use here to either pop back into the vessel lumen, um, but oftentimes I give another attempt at trying to go across the lesion back into the true lumen. So here I am using a slightly different wire, wiring technique. I prolapse the wire and I use the blunt end of the, the wire called the knuckle to push my way through. And again, I pop into what appears to be a vascular space. Um, and, as it trails along the vessel course, I advance my microcatheter, I inject, and I'm clearly in the lumen of this vessel so I can perform um, increasing diameter angioplasty. And the end result is recruiting a very large vessel and eventual hemodynamic improvements for the patient. We published our early uh, experience with CTOs very recently. It's still in press. Um, in that publication, we reported success successful interventions in 13 of 15 CTOs, um, but it took 21 procedures to achieve this level of success. These were CTOs we performed between August and February of 2020, but that gives us a success per attempt rate of 62% and a success per lesion uh, of 87%. And the only clinically relevant complications in these 21 procedures was that one patient had their procedure terminated early because of pulmonary perforation. And that's because it was an early uh, procedure in my experience and I was being cautious. Um, very likely that patient, we would have balloon tamponaded and felt confident to move ahead. Um, so that was the only thing that we found. Since this has come out uh, and since February of 2020, I've performed many more CTOs. Uh, I've now inter intervened on 32, over 38 procedures. I now have a success per attempt rate of 84% and a success per lesion rate of 94% because there is a learning curve. I'm also doing these much quicker. The complication rate kind of depends on what you think a, a, a meaningful complication is. I've had 24% and, uh, or at least vessel perforation occurs in 24%, one in four patients. Um, but as I mentioned, most of these require no active treatment or minimal treatment, and I'm able to continue on with the procedure. To date, I still have only one early procedural termination, now 2.6% per attempt. No patients require mechanical ventilation. The two intubated patients in the full series, these were not CTOs. I've had no deaths in these patients. And in comparison to Matsubara's data, I've done half the number of lesions, but I have nearly twice the success rate and more than half or less than half of the complications that are impactful to a patient. There is a bright future for this uh, intervention and for the treatment of this disease. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we need uh, help refining and standardizing techniques for intervention. We need improved pre-procedural imaging. It's very challenging to work and manipulate in a highly three-dimensional uh, vascular space. Um, and we need uh, additional data in identifying and characterizing those who are non-responders or only modest responders to figure out, is this the right intervention or do we need to modify our techniques for these patients? And we need BPA-specific equipment. All of the equipment we use are co-opted from the coronary or peripheral vascular disease world, and it makes it a challenge. I think UW is in a great um, position to really influence um, some of these issues. And we work with the community, at least in the United States at present, and we're tackling some of these at present. I wanna take a moment and recognize some people and some services who have really made um, this uh, program possible. 
Peter Leary is an outstanding partner um, and uh, has limitless energy and intellectual capacity. And he's just been uh, uh, just a true highlight of my involvement in this work. I wanna thank um, Drs. McClellan and Glennie who have supported this, um, uh, this program from the start. I wanna make special note of the, uh, my colleagues in interventional cardiology, Drs. Lombardi, McCabe, and Reisman. Um, they have provided unfailing support, a lot of mentorship through this, and have been very tolerant of me performing high-risk procedures and, um, and uh, have been part of the success of this. I also want to thank the UW Cath Lab staff, the MICU service, and the Cards Eye service um, for their amazing care of these patients.